everyone here for coming tonight. It's nice to see so many familiar faces, friendly faces who won't throw tomatoes at me. Um, I am speaking here tonight uh, for, at the Women's Club, and it's kind of fitting because my mother was a lifelong Women's Club member. She was the vice chair in charge of programming. She would set up events like this, set up speakers like this. I used to help her by writing letters to those people, um, thanking them, things like that. So I have a long appreciation for what the Women's Club does. Um, and I am not here speaking for myself tonight. I'm speaking on behalf of the committee. That is our committee, as Cheryl said, 15 members, all volunteers, appointed by the town. And we have a lot to do, so we break up into subcommittees and focus on different areas. What I'm presenting tonight comes from the entire committee, all these subcommittees. I just pulled it together and am the mouth for, mouthpiece for us tonight. Uh, as they say in the books, though, any errors are strictly mine. <laughs> so, And on behalf of the committee, I want to thank the Women's Club uh, for all you do, candidates, events, your charitable giving, but most importantly, for the speaker series you've had. Last year, you had Dr. Jane Knott here, and she talked about climate change. It's here. If you did not see that presentation, it's on YouTube. It was wonderful. She captured the whole thing from a global perspective and then took it down to the Northeast. And we also thank you for continuing that by bringing it down to the local level in Hopkinton and having us here tonight. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat what Dr. Knott said, but I think it is important to just go over a little bit about climate change before we jump down to the local level. So here's the one minute, very quick version of climate change. Temperatures, global warming's happening fast, largely because we're burning fossil fuels. Species are going extinct and being harmed. Humans are suffering a great deal through deadly droughts, expensive flooding. You've seen it on the news. It's getting worse. It's going to continue. It won't go away on its own. And we need a concerted effort to address it, to mitigate it. You saw the smoke this summer. You saw the floods in Western Mass. You saw the floods in Vermont. New York from Hurricane Sandy, heat out in Phoenix. This is what we're facing. And you can see this was a picture from the Independent this summer, a lot of rain, tornado warning. But all those places I mentioned, they're actually feeling it worse than us right now. OK, I want to take a minute and have you think about why you're here. Dr. Knott said it was critical for everyone to participate for everyone to be in the conversation. So spend a minute and think why you came. And if you say, oh, I came to find out if I should keep the lids on my plastic bottles when I recycle or not, I want you to bump that up a level. Why is that important? <laughs> why does that matter? And then I'd like you to um, just get that clear in your head, maybe down to a, a little sentence. And I'm going to ask you to talk to other people. Share that with somebody sitting near you. Maybe somebody you don't know, maybe somebody you know. A lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight is hard to change. Some of these things are very systemic and ingrained. So it's really important to keep your why in mind. I'm going to give you an example. Some people say, I care about climate change because maybe it won't affect me that much, but I'm worried about my kids and my grandkids. And then they turn around and say, and I fly to see them 10 times a year because they live in California, not realizing all those emissions are jeopardizing their future. It's tough. You want to see your kids, but you don't want to screw up their future. So I say these are tough decisions, um, and it's important you keep in mind the why. And I'm just going to share briefly with you why I care. So um, there are a lot of problems in the world. There are monstrously wide sidewalks outside and bike paths. There is the Patriots not having the best year. There's tax increases looming, and there's wars. There's really big problems. But this is one that's pervasive. It will affect every single millimeter of the planet and, and way below that. And it's something that I'm responsible for. My choices every day contribute to this problem. That's bad, but it's also great because it means there's something I can do about it. So that's why I care, and that's why I'm here. Um, so think about your whys when you get a little overwhelmed and disheartened, and remember you can do something about things. All right, now I want to ask you, you can just shout out some answers. What do you think it means to be eco-friendly? That's the title of the talk. 
You might get a reward, you might not, but. <laughs> Anybody? What do you think it means? What's an example, something you do that's eco-friendly? Great. Anybody else? What's that? Great. Excellent. Amy, you can give some, what's that? Great. Somebody can get a, a little reward. One person. We're going to be a little arbitrary here, just like climate change affects people arbitrarily. Um, okay, so here are the top answers we normally get. Green up days. I go clean up trash around the lakes and on the highways. I recycle, which someone here said. I take my own shopping bags to the supermarket, and I fill my water bottle. I don't um, use disposable plastics. And that is all eco-friendly, but it is so much more than that. And most people don't realize that. So what we're going to talk about tonight is climate change and toxins. And those things fit into it, but we're really going to reframe and focus on things that have the biggest impact and try to work on them in a way that can have the biggest impact by rethinking. And you'll see some of this later in our examples. So we don't want to focus on the little things. If you can't see that, it's a bathroom door in a building, and it says, what do you mean the office has gone paperless? We don't want to be ridiculous. <laughs> so, all right, all of this I'm presenting tonight is either in or related to our climate action plan in town. And this, doc, this is a comprehensive document. You can read it. There's a copy back there. You can't read it here tonight. But you can get it on hopgreen.org. There's a draft there. It was prepared by a subcommittee of our committee. Talks about the current state of the climate in Hopkinton. Talks about our goals and how we're going to meet them. And so let's not talk about global warming anymore, but talk about Hopkinton warming. What's going to happen here in town? OK. In 2050, just a little more than 25 years from now, most of us will be alive then. We're going to feel like we're in Maryland. The temperature now is 50 degrees on average. It's going to go up by 2 to 6 degrees. Here in Hopkinton, more importantly, days over 90 degrees, which really matter for people's health, are going to go from about 10 now to 20 or 60, depends how the models work out, just in 25 years. By 2070, it's going to feel like we're living in North Carolina with those temperatures and far more days over 90. By 2090, which I honestly know I won't be here, but I don't think anyone, some people here might be actually, um, the temperature is going to go up even more. We're going to feel like we're living in Georgia. So some of you know what the heat has been like in Florida, in Phoenix this year. It was just unbearable. I have a friend here whose daughter lives in Texas. The heavy heat and humidity affected her, she works outdoors, affected her this year. We are going to see much more of that here in town. Okay, the other part that goes along with warming is precipitation. How's that going to change in town? Well, the average might stay the same because we're going to have droughts and we're going to have lots of rainfall. So overall, it's a wash, right? Not necessarily. Maximum daily precipitation is what causes all the damage. Right now, it's about four inches this year. By 2050, 10 to 25 inches in a day is what we might see as the maximum in a year. Look how high it gets to 2090. These are if we do nothing, if we keep just going our merry old way. So the current Massachusetts record is 18 inches. That happened in 1955 during a hurricane. So you can see we're going to far exceed that in some of our lifetimes. Um, okay, these are some of the other less obvious or uh, known effects. And I want to point out that higher energy bills will probably more be due to air conditioning than they are to heating. Probably goes without saying. So you also want to think about things like the smoke that happens this year from the fires in Canada. We're going to have a lot more of that. More ticks, more pathogens as the climate warms. Insurance carriers. In Florida, they only have two insurance carriers left. People can't even get insurance. Your favorite animal might go extinct. The fish might die from the algae blooms caused by the warm water. So this is where things are headed. All right, what's causing that here in town? 
So we talked about its greenhouse gas emissions are large, that we produce from fossil fuels are largely um, causing this. And what you'll see, this is our chart. The baseline we took was in 2017. Sum it up like this. Passenger vehicles, about a third. Our residences, just under a third. Our commercial buildings, our industrial buildings, about a third. The, the, so basically, buildings are just under two-thirds, vehicles about a third. That's pretty much how it is in the rest of our country, too. Here's what the actual numbers are of emissions that we emitted in 2017. We're pretty much like the rest of the country, but we need to know where to focus our priorities and to measure to see where things are headed. Uh, the other things are municipal buildings, municipal vehicles, waste, stuff like that. But we're going to focus on the heavy hitters tonight. All right, we have newer data from 2021. The percentages are pretty much unchanged where it comes from. But look, the number went down. Yay, right? Jump up and down. Not quite. If you do the math, it's about 5% over four years. It'll take us 75 years to get to the point where we're no longer emitting greenhouse gases. So maybe we won't be Georgia, but we'll still probably be like South Carolina in 2090. All right, how do you think we compare to other places? Here is, now we have to look at per person, right? Because Boston's going to have way more emissions than we are. They have more people. But if you do it per person, this is our number, 10.8 uh, metric tons. Do you think we're better or worse than the rest of Mass? Just shout it out. I hear a mix. OK. We are worse. Why do you think that might be? We tend to drive bigger cars and have bigger homes here. That's one reason. There could be other reasons, but that's one. How do you think Massachusetts compares to the rest of the company, country, better or worse? 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 <coughs> Actually, we're better. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. I'm not going to get into them. Part of it's how you slice the pies, but really the whole country is a problem. How do you think the U.S. compares to the rest of the world? Worse. worse. worse? Anybody say better? You say better? Okay, you do not get a laundry tab. <laughs> yeah, a little goodie bag. We are way worse. We are way worse than the rest of the world. Um, in fact, we're among the highest emitters by far. And this is a really important time to point out that people who live in places where they're not emitting hardly any greenhouse gases end up being very affected. If you lived in Cape Verde, your number would be under two. Yet that island's country off of Africa is really facing the effects of the sea level rise and the global warming. Um, so just keep that in mind. What we do here is affecting the rest of the world. All right, so what are we doing about this? What's our goal in town? Well, some of you were at town meeting last year in May, and you voted maybe for our net zero resolution. And that says by 2045, not 2090, we're going to take a lot of efforts to make sure we get greenhouse gases down to zero. And we have some interim targets. You might notice this is a little faster than the state goal and the federal goal and the international goal of 2050. This isn't because we're so great. You saw we're actually a little worse than some places, but because we feel we have the resources and therefore the obligation to do so. This is what the chart looks like with the interim targets. That red line is the one we're on currently. And I do want to point out that 2021, when we did go down, was actually during the pandemic. I really don't know where things will be in 2023. However, we do have our plans going forward. There were no plans in place. We did do some things, but nowhere near enough, obviously. All right, so what can we do? One thing is offsetting emissions, and I'm not going to talk much about this tonight, but I just want to mention it. Trees, oceans, they absorb greenhouse gases. So we're lucky. In Hopkinton, we have 60-some percent of our land is trees. They sequester gases. They can absorb about 4% of our emissions. You can't plant enough trees to absorb all of what we have, though. Um, they also help mitigate flooding uh, from happening. But we need to preserve our trees in order to have them help. We also can produce solar energy in excess of what we use, and that can help with emissions in other places as well. Massachusetts can do it with wind farms. We don't have any of those here. But really, we want to focus on reducing emissions. 
And there are three prongs to this. Um, somebody here said, you want to know what we can do as people? Well, I list that as residents. But I want to start by talking about what our government has been doing and will continue to do. And I want to end with just a little bit on businesses and organizations. Businesses, because you saw, they make up a third of our emissions in town. All right, from a government perspective, even though this is a talk about local, uh, the federal government passed the, climate, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a huge climate bill um, last year, and that's going to have a big impact on Hopkinton. We'll get a lot of incentives to implement some of the things we want to. This year, they introduced the Climate Corps, which is supposed to give jobs to youth who want to work in climate. The state government, just like we have a climate action plan that we're producing, they agreed to one in 2022. Mass save does not exist everywhere. It's called mass save. We are really lucky that the state passed this law that lets us save money by saving energy. They really want us to save energy, so they're going to pay us to do it. And there are some green power requirements. Um, and what I'm, I'm going to explain what this means because we refer to it more later. If you heat your home with oil, you're burning a fossil fuel. If you heat your home with gas, you're burning a fossil fuel. If you heat with your home with electricity, you may or may not be burning a fossil fuel. Most likely it's a mix, because the electric plant uses gas, uses oil, uses biomass, but more and more is using solar and wind, the clean sources of energy. So right now, we're required to have 22% of our energy come from green sources, and that number is going to go up. So these are some legislative things happening to reduce emissions. Here's what we've been doing in town and what we're going to continue to do. Uh, we talked about the Climate Action Plan. We talked about the Net Zero Resolution. We have a Sustainable Green Committee. Yay! A lot of us are here tonight. We hired Julia Chun this, a few months ago. The town did. She's uh, a project manager for sustainability, economic development, and equity. There was a Solarize program the Sustainable Green Committee did in town 10 years ago. You got a really big break on your solar panels. That's how I got mine back then. We put a lot of solar panels on town buildings, like the high school. We put smart thermostats, smart light controls in a lot of our buildings, heat pumps. Our police cruisers are maybe by now all hybrid or close, EV charging stations. So these are a lot of things the town has done. I'm going to talk now about two new things we're doing from a town legislative perspective. The first one is called municipal aggregation. Remember we talked about the big sources of emissions, buildings, two-thirds, vehicles, a third, about. Um, this one affects buildings, and I'm going to explain it this way. Currently, Eversource both supplies our energy and delivers it. So they send it out through the wires, and they also provide the stuff going through the wires. The stuff that goes through the wires is the part that can be from gas or can be from oil or can be from green sources. So what municipal aggregation does is it says, we don't have to use Eversource. We can pick our own supplier. And we can go for, out for bids and get a bulk rate and maybe negotiate that price down. But from a green perspective, oh, also Eversource will still deliver the, we're not going to replace them. They're still going to have all the wires. They're going to send us one bill for everything. However, we have options for greener sources. So instead of that 22%, maybe you can choose, I want 50% of my energy to come from green sources. And that will let us move towards net zero. Uh, we're currently selecting the vendor. That should be done by 20, it should be in place by 2025. We're a little behind the eight ball on this one. Half the towns in Massachusetts have it now, about half. This is a hard one for people to remember what it is. So I came up with a fun little icon. Think of it as buying in bulk like you do at BJ's, but it's for electricity. So instead of an apostrophe, you get that little electric mark and you have green choices. So that's how you can remember what that complicated word is. All right, the other thing we're currently working on also pertains to buildings and that's building codes. There's been a little bit of work to make buildings more green through codes, but this is a current proposal. It affects residential and business. It's called the Specialized Building Code. We'll be voting at it, on it at this November's town meeting. Basically, it says any new construction, so it doesn't affect your existing home, anything new has to have higher efficiency. If we pass this now, 
by 2045, 10% of our homes won't have to do a thing. They'll have been green all along. They'll be green in 2045. So it has a big impact on our emissions because remember, buildings contribute a lot and we don't have to retrofit things, which is expensive. So it actually saves money to do it now. The details are, it says, you have to pre-wire your appliances to use electric. If you like a gas stove or a grass dryer, you have to be pre-wired to put electric in. If you still want to use gas, even given that, you're going to have to put solar on your house to help offset the problems you're causing by burning gas for your dryer, for example. And it also says for larger buildings that they either have to come in at net zero or be highly efficient. So please vote at special town meeting. This is our committee's proposal, so I can say unequivocally we support it. Um, it's Monday, November 13th, 7 p.m. at the middle school. They just announced that. Um, a green vote would be a yes vote. There are a couple other things on the ballot that night. The Elmwood School replacement, it was designed to meet this new code and it goes beyond it. It also, when built, would avoid costly retrofitting that would have to be done later to meet the emissions goals. And there's a land acquisition proposed at South Street. That's green too because it helps with carbon offsets, the sinks, and it also helps us preserving open space. All right, so we talking about climate emissions. Remember the other part of eco-friendly, it's not just climate emissions. We also want to talk about other forms of pollution, toxins and waste. They do have some impacts on global warming, but more than that, they affect the species health directly. So for example, this includes PFAS. This includes pesticides that really have an effect on young kids' brains, and yet we use them. We use them on our town common, for example. Uh, waste seepage can cause real problems. And what these do is they disrupt ecosystems. One example is lawns. They're not actually natural, you know. They might look it, but they're not. It takes a lot of herbicides and pesticides to keep them looking that way. Those run off, they get into the water. The water now has fertilizer. It grows algae, plus the global warming. Now you can't swim in the water because there's poisonous algae in it. Your dogs will die if they drink the water. The fish will die off and the lake will dry up. So this is why we care about the toxins and waste too. Um, and that's all part of being eco-friendly. This was a sculpture that Bob Gilbert, a member of our committee, made. It shows fish, fish with plastic around them in them. I love the quote, when they eat plastic and pesticides for dinner, so do you. So it's important to remember that if you use pesticides, you're going to end up eating or drinking them. All right, here's a different perspective on this. We have a spotted lantern fly who is pointing to a person on the screen. And if you can't read that, it says, they're an invasive species that will destroy the environment if left unchecked. And it's the lantern fly saying that. Um, OK, we said we were going to talk about toxins and waste. Now we're going to switch to waste. Here's how much waste we produce in Hopkinton. The average household, 2,000 pounds a year. I don't know if you're surprised by that or not. Do you think we are better or worse than the greenest towns in Hopkinton? Do you think we're one of the greenest or not? No? OK, somebody gets a little, a little goodie back there. Um, the greenest ones are about 750 pounds a year. So they're about a third of what we do. Think about that. And we'll talk later about why. And you see that truck driving the trash away? Trash doesn't go away. It goes somewhere. It ends up in our water. It ends up in our landfills. So things like glass bottles might be around 400 years from now. A plastic fork you got in your takeout the other day and didn't even use might be in that landfill 100 years from now. Cardboard, on the other hand, won't last more than two months. So we have a lot of cleanup to do. We really do have to not just stop what we're doing, but heal all the damage we've caused so far. All right, are you uh, ready for what we can do about it? We can recycle all that plastic, right? Somebody here said they recycle. OK, I recycle too, or I try to. I look at the little number on the bottom. I say, oh my gosh, am I allowed to recycle that or not? I take my reusable bags to the supermarket, so less plastics going into our waste stream. But look at this cartoon. I love this. 
the checkout clerk is saying to the shopper, did you remember to bring your own bag, sir? We're trying to cut down on our use of plastic. But look behind, the laundry detergent, the shaver, everything, plastic everywhere. But that little bag, got to feel great about it. You should, I mean, do that. But remember I talked before about reframing. We really want to look where we can make the most impact. And I'm going to give an example in a little bit while you're, where you will see that. I call them the seven re's because they all start with R-E. Um, so the first one is respect. You have to start with your, your why. Do you respect the environment? Do you respect that you want Earth to be here in 2090 for your kids or grandkids or yourself if you're young? Um, I'm just going to, I don't know if everyone can read them. I'm just going to read them. I'll talk about some of them. It involves rethinking and redesigning things, which I'll get into detail with an example coming up. Refuse stuff. I don't want that plastic fork in my takeout. Reduce, buy less things. Reuse things, cut up your towels to turn them into cloths instead of buying throwaway cloths. Compost, which is reusing, but it's actually upcycling. You're taking scraps and turning them into a valuable soil additive. Get things fixed, like at the repair cafe we had. Don't throw your appliances away. Recycle, which we just talked about. But the higher up on there, the more impact you can probably have. Things down at the bottom, they usually happen later in the cycle, less impact. And if you can't do any of those, responsibly dispose of things. So here's an example. All right, Tide laundry detergent. One of the things on that supermarket shelf we just saw in that cartoon. So. It's plastic, right? You're going to recycle it. You think you're doing the right thing. Well, guess what? That plastic weighs six pounds because it's mostly water. So now we're using all the gas to ship six pounds of plastic, which is uh, six pounds of laundry detergent, which is mostly water from the Procter & Gamble plant out in Ohio or wherever it is to here and then to all the store shelves. And we're doing that how many times a day for all those laundry detergents and all the other products? Instead, suppose you used a laundry tablet, like that's what's in those goodie bags, by the way. It's a little, um, little round white tablet. You can kind of see it in the bottom there. There's no water in it. it. A, it comes in a paper bag, so no recycling of that plastic. It won't stick around forever. And we're not spending greenhouse gases shipping water around. So you thought the right answer is, oh, I'm going to recycle that plastic jug? you'll have much more impact if we use things that have been redesigned to minimize emissions. Now, did you see any of these laundry tabs in Price Chopper? No, you won't see them. You'll still see all that plastic and you wanna think about why. The main reason is the Procter & Gamble company has spent the last 70 years in billions of dollars convincing us that if we don't use that orange jug, which is how we recognize them, our clothes will look dingy, will stink, no one will talk to us. So they can't turn around and say, oh, now we're going to do something different. It would cost them a lot of money to do that. You can order these online. I haven't seen them in our supermarkets, maybe at Whole Foods or something. Um, and it's not just Tide, it's all of them. I don't mean to pick on Tide. It's just the most recognizable. So we're going to start talking now about what you can do. That was one example. Um, a lot of these things actually aren't easy, and that's why we want you to remember your whys. It's systemic. Procter & Gamble is spending all that money. The Everybody's been doing things the same way for so long. Nobody knows how to do things differently. We live in a capitalistic society. The goal is not to save the earth. The goal is to create profit. How do you do that? Consumerism. May people buy. Make them buy more. Make them buy more. That is what our society's goals are. Billions of dollars, probably trillions, are spent drilling these messages into our head everywhere we look. We don't even see it. So it's really hard to combat these systemic problems. Um, yay, we have free markets, we have free choice, but it can lead to the problems we're seeing, like it's going to be 90 days of, uh, of, uh, nine, of you know, temperatures over 90 degrees or something. Nothing is free. Yeah, we have free markets and free choice, but payback is, you know, uh, painful. So one thing that um, Alvin Toffler, he writes about the future, he said, 
The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that's the only way to deal with systemic issues. You have to unlearn so much of what you learned. And that's why I say it's not easy. You often feel like you're pushing. So remember your whys, why you care about this stuff. Focus on one big thing you can change at a time. Focus on one small thing so that you feel like you're getting a win. And now we're going to talk about what some of those things can be. We have a top 14 things you can do to make a difference. All right, the first one relates to governing and legislative. It's not what they can do, it's what you can do. The first one is, again, vote green. And the reason we're talking about this, this is going to have a big impact. If we vote for this, this will take care of a lot of emissions. So things like that, advocate for legislation that's green. Contact your legislators. We have a bill that our own congressman in the US House proposed to minimize pesticides. Write in support of that. When there's opportunities to vote for people who care about these things, consider it. Herbicides in Lake Maspinock are really being considered for soon. If you have a feeling about that, do something. Advocate perhaps that they not be used after you've learned about the consequences and the other options. Make sure you take advantage of government incentives like we talked about. There are a lot of EV rebates out there and Mass Save is really a gift and that's why it gets its whole own slide. It's number two on the hit parade. Again, it's addressing one of the big two-thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions, which are buildings. How many people here have used Mass Save? Quite a lot, great. So you can get a free audit. They come in and look at your house and tell you where you can be making efficiency improvements in energy. Did you know you can get a Mass Save audit every two years? Things change, technology changes, your home changes. Maybe there are more things you can do. Take advantage of that. You'll save money on things like insulation and ceiling. You'll get rebates on appliances. If you bought a weed cutter or a chainsaw this year, you could have probably saved 50 bucks if you went to Mass Save and just got the rebate form. They do windows. And you can get 0% interest loans for a lot of this stuff, which is really amazing. So use Mass Save. Related to that, number three is also a Mass Save thing. Get heat pumps. Does anybody here have heat pumps now? A few people, great. Mm. Again, these are important because they address emissions from buildings. That's what heat pumps look like in case you don't know. They're kind of like air conditioners. There's a unit outside your house and then there will be some kind of unit inside your house or units. They are different configurations, um, but they do heating and cooling. So heat pumps, that's kind of a lie. They're heating and cooling pumps. And why are they, why is everybody talking about them? Why are they a big deal? They're very efficient for heating and cooling, better than any other way to heat or cool. They use electric. So remember we talked about before, if you're burning your furnace with oil or gas, you're burning fossil fuels. At least if you're using electric, a minimum of 22% of your power today will be green. If you have solar panels, more. As we add more green to the grid, you'll maybe get to the point where you're not burning fossil fuels to uh, heat or cool your home. There are huge rebates. You can get up to $16,000 back when you install heat pumps. Again, you get those 0% loans. You don't have to pay them back for up to seven. You pay them back over the course of seven years. We have a bank in town. Estella works at Webster First Federal Credit Union. They process these loans. She has a lot of experience with it. And this applies not only to heat pumps, but heat pump hot water heaters, which I just found out about last week, and I'm going to do that one this year. So take advantage of heat pumps. Number four on the hit parade is get solar panels, if you can. Again, we're focusing on buildings. So you can buy them or you can have the installer put them on your roof. If the installer puts them on your roof, you'll get reduced energy rates. You'll be using greener energy, but they'll make any profit on them and probably some of what your savings. If you buy them, you're making an investment, but you're going to save back money over time. They allow for battery backup. When electricity goes down, you may be able to store some of the electricity you produce. Uh, but not everybody can use them. And with, um, if you can't use them, and even if you can, but you can't produce enough electricity, 
You can get greener sourced energy right now. Remember, municipal aggregation is coming that will allow it. And in the meantime, you actually can pick your own supplier. I know John here does. Go to our website if you want more information on that. All right, number five. This is the last one on buildings. And this one might hurt a little. Um, minimize square footage. Remember we talked about why Hopkinton might have more emissions than other places? Buildings make up two-thirds of our emissions. Residence is about a third. We have big square footage houses. This contributes to global warming. So when you're making decisions, nobody's saying move out of your house today. When you're making decisions about your living arrangements, about owning a second home, consider that the square footage has a huge environmental impact. It reduces green space. If you have a house that's four times as big as another house, you're wiping out a lot of green land. Um, it takes a lot more energy to build and maintain a bigger house, a lot more to stock it with all the extra stuff you need. You may be driving to your vacation home every weekend feeling you need to use it. And if you're going to have a bigger house because you already do or you have a second home, at least try to make it green to make up for some of this. Put solar on it, buy green electricity, get heat pumps, things like that. So that's a hard one. Um, and this is a point to say that a lot of this isn't easy. We said that. Higher income and higher wealth directly translate to higher emissions. It's just a fact. One of the reasons is people who don't have income and wealth just can't afford to spend the money to cause more emissions. But there are other reasons. We want bigger things. We think we need them. And the top 10% of income earners in the US, which a lot of people in Hopkinton are, produce about 40% of the emissions in the country. So this is again a reminder to say the choices we make impact a lot of other people way beyond our footprint on the planet. So we're done talking about buildings now, and we're going to switch over to what's the second biggest cause of emissions in town? What? Cars, right, vehicles. All right, oh, but before we do, here's a quote from Rachel Carson. We're challenged, she was an early leader in the environmental movement, uh, 50s, 60s, I think. We're challenged as humankind has never been challenged before to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of ourselves, but of nature. So I don't want any of this to come across as judgy, like, oh, I have a second home. I'm not judging you. If you litter, I am judging you. But other than that, you're not being judged for your choices. Just know that your choices have an impact. And when you have a chance to make better choices, consider the green impact. All right, so we're not starting out with EVs, which you might have thought we would. And the reason is most of you aren't going to have it. How many people have EVs here now? Oh, quite a few. Most of us in this room may not have EVs for the next few years. Eventually, we all will. But until then, and even when you get them, because EVs still use energy, right? They plug in, but that might come from oil and gas for a while. We should always be trying to minimize the energy we spend on transportation. So walk and bike. We have really great new bike lanes out here. Take advantage of them. <laughs> um, take the commuter rail to work or on the weekends. They have a $10 all weekend pass. You can ride the commuter rail into Boston, out to Worcester, wherever you want to go. We have a bus in town. I bet people didn't know that, the MWRTA. When you're in the city, don't necessarily Uber it. Use subways. These are all better than personal vehicles. Take the Logan Express instead of driving yourself to the airport. Carpool, like when you're coming to the meeting tonight. Combine your trips, work online, do FaceTime instead of visiting people, and use your lowest mile per gallon vehicle. You do not need your pickup truck or your SUV to go get a can of, a bottle of milk down at the supermarket. So those are some things you can do whether or not you have an EV, but number seven is get an EV. So this is uh, Jeff Kaufman from Hopkinton. He has an ID4, and he says, it's fun, I'm glad we switched. The range is 300 miles, it's a smooth ride. We got $10,000 in rebates, free charging for three years. So glad we did it, and it's great for the environment. So why are EVs great? No tailpipe emissions. That third of the emissions we cause, they're not going to come from this. 
So granted, there are some emissions used to charge your car because the electricity source might be gas or might be oil, but the equivalent mile per gallon you're getting with an EV is this or higher. I know John says he gets up to near 200 because he buys green energy and all kinds of things like that. Gas vehicles are at least six times worse than EVs in terms of emission. With incentives, they can be affordable, especially as they start bringing the prices down and making smaller models. You can charge easily at home. Nicole, who's back there from our committee, says, I go to sleep at night, I wake up with a full tank of gas, and I didn't even have to go to a gas station. Um, on road trips, it's a little challenging, but you can do, use apps to help you plan. There's a lot more infrastructure being put in place. Take the pledge, next car you get, promise it'll be an EV. If you can't do it for whatever reason, I'm not sure we can for our van, um, at least get a plug-in hybrid or the highest mile per gallon car you can. There's no excuse for getting giant gas guzzlers anymore. All right, here's how we're looking in Hopkinton. We have a number of hybrids. We have plug-in hybrids, that's what the PHEV is, and we've seen a big increase over the past six years in the number of electric vehicles. We think that's going to go at an even steeper rate, and we're looking forward to the numbers in 2024 in February. Also about vehicles, these emissions aren't counted within our town, but they really have a big impact. I mentioned it earlier, fly less. This is another one that hurts. So per mile, flying produces more emissions than any other form of transportation. One round trip flight here to LA, about 5% of your annual emissions will be from that one flight. What can you do instead? We talked earlier, virtual meetings, pick locations that minimize flying, only use non-stops because most of the emissions are in takeoff and landings, fly coach, try to take fewer trips. I love vacations. I've promised to only fly once every other year for a vacation, whereas I used to go every year, and I'm sure I'm gonna have to bring that down. All right, so now we're done talking about vehicles, and we've now covered the two big hitters, buildings and um, vehicles. So we're gonna slice the cake another way. The cake was sliced in layers. We had two or three layers before. Now we're gonna slice it a different way. And we're gonna talk about other things that have big impacts. This one, eat fewer animal products. Again, this doesn't directly count in our town's emissions, but it's really important when you slice the pie a different way. This one you think hurts, but honestly, it's not that hard. It's pretty easy at least to get started, and once you're started, things may snowball. So the food system in total accounts, if we slice the pie a different way, accounts for a third of emissions. Shipping the food all around, growing the food, taking the waste and shipping that to um, <coughs> the landfill. It takes a lot of energy to feed animals, to raise animals, and to transport them. They produce methane. It's a far worse greenhouse gas than carbon emissions. And grazing land replaced those nice carbon sinks that the forests are, um, far more than you would to grow crops. Here are the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food products. You have a kilogram of beef, that's the number at the top, produces about 100 kilograms of carbon emissions. That is, look how huge it is compared to everything else. So the message from that is beef should be rare, and I do not mean the way it's cooked, you should rarely eat beef. Um, go nuts, beef, compared to nuts at the bottom, 200 times more greenhouse gas emissions. You're getting protein with both of them, but one of them is much worse for the environment. Cheese is actually not a great choice. I still eat a lot of cheese, almost never beef. I should really cut that out more. I'd say start with one meatless meal a week. Take it to one meatless day or a few meatless meals, and before you know it, you'll be down to, we're only eating one meat meal a week on average. Um, and speaking of food, you should try to get food that's locally grown. You can go to a farmer's market like the ones in town or join the CSA. And if you can, try to get organic food so you're not putting toxins in the environment. But the number one thing, please don't eat meat. Don't eat beef, especially. All right, the next biggest one is also related to food. We waste a lot of food. 
Any idea how much food we waste at home? Any other guesses? 30? Who said 30? John? All right, John gets a laundry tablet. Again, we're at about a third. We throw out about a third of our food, which is really sad. The entire food system wastes even more through spoilage, through crop failures, things like that. Overall food waste, not food, because we said food in total was about a third when you cut up the pie, but the food waste itself, 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So what you can do, of course, is eat leftovers, and um, some people don't, you know, hey, go ahead. Buy less at a time, and I think that's especially important at the holidays. Um, and one thing someone taught me that really helps with this is um, she does a little thing before she eats, and I try to do it when I remember. Think about all that went into the food you got. So let's say you have a turkey or stuffing on the table or a pie. It had to be planted. The soil had to be developed. It had to be grown. A lot of it might have died. Some of it got lost in shipping. And then somebody had to get it to the store. A whole bunch of people had to work at night stocking the shelves. Then somebody produced it. So before you just wolf it down, think about all the energy and love that went into making it. And that's where the respect and the values come into helping you make better choices. All right, the next one is also related to food, sort of, plus, and it's composting as the verb, not the noun. This does affect vehicles. It does relate to waste. Because when we're transporting our food scraps and leaves to, leaves to the um, waste station, that's producing emissions. We're just shipping junk around. And those cars, those not the cars, usually the trucks, are spewing greenhouse gas emissions to ship that um, to the landfill. It also costs us money to do that. We pay for tipping fees in our town. It costs more money to have more waste. Um, so food. Scraps and leaves that are burned or go into landfills themselves cause emissions. As they disintegrate, they cause emissions. As they're burnt, they cause emissions. So if you don't know what compost is, it's what happens when your food scraps and your leaves disintegrate and it turns into a beautiful soil en enhancing product that you can put in your garden. How to compost. You can either do it in your backyard or you can get a service if you don't want to or can't do it in your backyard. So here we have, um, on the left there, you can see a composter you can put in your backyard, or you can make bins and turn things. Um, the green bin is the Black Earth Service. It costs about $7 a week here in Hopkinton if you do the every other, every other week pickup. And we're working with the Department of Public Works for incentives to try to make the cost of that go down. Uh, and that's what compost looks like when it's all done. And all the cool kids are doing it. They started composting at the high school last year in the cafeteria, and they're going to expand it to the other schools, which is, isn't that great that we're doing that? Just awesome. The next one, consume less. You might have, maybe could have guessed, but this has a big impact. So how? You have to use the things over here and think about ways to do it. But here are some examples. Uh, we call it slow fashion. Instead of throwing out your shoes from last year because they're not in style, just keep wearing them or buy more timeless styles. Buy second hand. Donate clothes that other people can use. Give things a second use, like cutting up your towels and turning them into washcloths instead of, or rags instead of going out and buying those disposable rags. Um, repair things. Fix your appliances, like at the repair fair. And one way to measure whether you're doing a good job with composting, recycling, consuming less, is look at how much trash you take out per year. How many times do you take your bin out? 10 minutes? OK, great. Um, OK, so look at how much you take your bins out. We're down to about once a month, and most of our garbage in our trash bin is what I pick up when I'm walking on the, on the walks. So you can get your trash down to almost nothing if you do a lot of these things. Be cheap is really the rule. If you're cheap, you're probably being green. OK, so not all of this is easy. But again, live more simply so more people can simply live. Remember the effects we're having on other people. 
And now the moment everyone's been waiting for, drum roll, recycling tips, because I heard you wanted to hear about this. Now remember, recycling might not always be the best thing to do, but we still need to do it, and these might help you do it better. The wrong stuff is what screws up recycling. And here's what the wrong stuff is, things that cause equipment problems. So they need to be able to sort things easily, and they need to have things not tangle up the equipment and screw it up. So no plastic bags in recycling ever. No plastic films, meaning the plastic sheets that your paper towels might come in or your toilet paper. You need to rinse your food and beverage containers. Don't put the pickle jar in with the pickle still in it. You don't have to lick out every last drop of the chocolate sauce, but do rinse them. No wires, no loose lids, so that answers the question. Yes, you should put your lids on your um, bottles, mainly so they don't clog up the machinery if they're loose. No shredded paper, some people are surprised at that. It clogs up the machinery. So, in terms of metal, you can do cans and bottles. No coat hangers, things like that. In terms of paper, almost all paper, including junk mail works, not shredded paper though, think of clogging. But take any plastic out from the junk mail, take any samples that might be in there. Plastics, this is the hardest one, because those numbers, they are meaningless. Uh, one, two, three, six, doesn't mean anything. This is what Recycle Smart says, and it kind of rhymes. Bottle, jug, jar, tub. Bottle, jug, jar, tub. If you can remember that, those things mostly are what can be recycled. And when in doubt, do not throw it in the garbage instead. Go to RecycleSmartMass.org, RecycleSmartMA.org. You just type in, can I recycle this, and it will give you the answer. So there's your answers to all the recycling questions you ever had. Um, okay, plastics get their own page too, because they're, they're nasty. They have ecosystem and health impacts. PFAS, which everyone here knows about very well, is found in some plastics. Some of the other components will pollute water, land, other living things. You can recycle some plastics, but even the recycling uses energy. So think about that example with the Tide detergent. You really want to switch to something that doesn't use plastics where you can. They last, as we said, for hundreds of years. Look at that picture. That is a bird. It's got all kinds of plastic in its belly. They eat the plastic. It just makes me so sad, and then they die from that. So what can you do about it? You have to look at that rechart. You know, think about not the plastic jug, but the laundry tabs, things like that. It definitely isn't easy. Remember that plastics cartoon at the supermarket? Plastics are everywhere. It's almost impossible to not use them. Um, this one fork that you may or may not even use, but it got put in your bag automatically, that can stick around for 100 years. Just don't get it. Tell them you don't want it. So what else can you do? Um, don't buy plastic bags. Reuse the bags that your bread or your bagels came in or something. Put your sandwiches in that. Put dog poop in that. Um, what else? You can take your own bags. You can shop at farmer's markets where they really don't use plastic bags. And how about this? I've seen challenges. This town versus that town in terms of Halloween decorations. 14 foot high plastic skeletons and things like that everywhere. Our town has the better decorations. Why don't we have a challenge? Which town can recycle more? Which town has more pounds of composting per year? I like to see those contests in the papers. All right, number 14, redo your lawns and gardens. Again, for ecosystem impacts. This one hurts too because you spend a lot of money and time making your lawn look really pretty and green, getting those exotic plants. None of this is natural. They're water hogs. They take a lot of chemicals to maintain. Those chemicals run off into the water and poison things, making our water unusable. They harm everything. They displace the natural habitats. They're not natural. So go with natives, plants and grasses. Plant your own vegetable garden. Start small. Mow less, much less, and there's some rules about raking, right, which I'm not quite clear on, but I'm sure someone else would know. So these are all the things that residents can do. We're now going to shift to that other topic of what businesses can do. So the, my first question is, why do we have to do everything? Why can't the businesses be coming up with solutions to these problems? Why can't Tide be told you're not allowed to use plastic anymore? 
it's just the way it is. But use the legislature to say, hey, tell these companies if there's an alternative that doesn't use plastic, they should do it. So push up. Um, one example of this is you can go to a place like that cardboard container is used at Erica's in Ashland for takeout food. Tell another restaurant, hey, get that cardboard container like Erica's uses. Don't give me this black plastic thing. Um, you can tell them, Price Chopper, please carry these laundry tablets. And then keep frequenting Erica's if nobody else is going to use the cardboard containers. Write about them. Give them green stars on a Yelp or something. If you are a business owner, all of these things we've talked about tonight apply to you. You need to uh, lead by example. If you're an employee of a business, try to drive change by joining a green committee or starting one. You can implement practices like try to reduce flying. Nicole has one from her company um, to help reduce flying. And if you invest in businesses, which probably everyone here does in their 401ks or whatever, don't invest in fossil fuel companies if you can help it. Choose green companies to invest in. Write to companies like Coca-Cola and say, I'm not going to invest in you anymore because you're of your plastic bottle problem. So these are ways businesses can um, be affected, uh, effective. The other one is organizations. And what do I mean by organizations? I mean like the women's club, like you members here, your kids' sports team, your own sports team or chorus, your church. Organizations have unique power because everybody knows each other and they're there by choice. They're not forced to be there. So what can you do? We have sustainable event guidelines. If you're having an event, come to your meetings, carpool. Don't have plastic cups for beverages. If you're having food, have composting at your event. Talk about it amongst yourselves. Have a meeting where you talk about how can our club, our group be more sustainable and then put those practices into place. Follow what our green committee is doing. Share with us what you've chosen to do. You can work with us. We have volunteer opportunities or you can take on your own project and for, for our town, either with youth or yourselves. So those are the things that organizations can do and we definitely could use your help. And so what's next? This is our last slide. So what's next is we get to go home. But before we go home, you get to visit the Barbie Green Home in the back, which is an absolutely adorable um, but very important model for showing all the things we talked about, all the ways you can be green. So make sure you check it out on your way out of here tonight. And also take home, we have some checklists back there on ways to be green in your house, in your garden and lawn, and with kids. And as a reminder, pick one big item you're going to commit to doing, like maybe heat pumps or a mass save audit. Pick one small easy item, like I'm only going to eat meat, you know, one less time this week. Uh, visit hopgreen.org. Use it as a local resource. We were linked off to other websites rather than repeat things that are well covered elsewhere. Come to our events. We just had a great mass save event last week. Two people showed up. The committee people who showed up, almost all of us found ways to save more energy and more money, but unfortunately the community wasn't there. Follow us. Um, you can sign up for our mailing list. There's a sheet back there. You can follow us on Facebook. You don't need a Facebook account. It's public. Instagram, you need an account, but if you like Instagram, use that. On both of them, we're HopGreenMA. Talk about it. Remember what Dr. Knott said. Conversing about climate change is the most and other eco-friendly practices is the most important thing you can do. Share your results with everyone and ask questions when you want to know things. All right, you're all experts. So go forth and be green. Check out the greenhouse. Remember to vote in November and pick up some of our checklists on the way out. Thank you all for coming.